Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International. Welcome. Hello and welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. Herzliche willkommen. Grüezi. Hola y buenos dias. Buongiorno. Bon dia. And aloha. <laughs> welcome, everyone. As I mentioned while you're coming on, I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International. I welcome all of you to our event today. And what we like to do is we like to start our events with a short um, blessing uh, to center ourselves before we begin our event. So I would invite all of you to just take a moment now to uh, sit back comfortably, shut your eyes and relax and take a deep breath, breathe in, and with your exhalation, relax. Breathe in, and with your exhalation, relax. One more time, breathe in, And with your exhalation, relax. Oh, Heavenly Father, Mother God, beloved source, beloved spirit, who is known by many names in many traditions, bless this meeting. Help all of us to be instruments of your love, light, and peace on our planet. Om peace, Shanti, Amen. Thank you, everyone. Welcome again. So, uh, as I mentioned previously, I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International, and I'll be hosting this meeting today together with Robert Baer, the vice president of Spiritual Awakenings International, and Brian Sackett, who is the board treasurer for Spiritual Awakenings International. And we truly are an international network, which is why I greeted you in seven different languages. We are delighted that we have uh, subscribers from 63 countries around the world, every continent from, except Antarctica, which is phenomenal. We invite you to put into the chat right now before we start where it is that you are Zooming in from today. We always love to know where everybody is joining us from. So I happen to be joining you from Toronto, Canada, and Robert Bear is joining you from uh, Newport, Oregon. And uh, please put in the chat where you are joining us from today. So I uh, hear she Town, England, Manhattan Beach, Seattle, Smith Falls, Newport, Amsterdam, how oh, San Diego, how wonderful. We have people from all over. Welcome everybody. Chicago, Illinois, Washington, DC. Welcome everybody. So um, today uh, I'd like to turn it over now to Robert Baer the Vice President of Spiritual Awakenings International, who will be giving some introductory comments. Robert. Thank you, Dr. Kaysan, and welcome everybody. It's a real honor to have you here. Thank you so much for being here on, on uh, the 15th of January, 2022. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce our board uh, members. Uh, you met Dr. Kaysan, she's our president. I'm her vice president. I'm the vice president, rather. Dr. Brian Sackett is our treasurer, and he just waved. Um, we're here today. And I'm going to talk about the format of the meeting because everybody's going to be muted except for the speaker during his, during his presentation. And at the very end, there will be a question and answer uh, portion of the presentation. And if you use the chat, you can write your questions into the chat and uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Sackett will be the person that's in charge of the question and answer period. And by the way, uh, he just took that position over from Linda Truax, uh, who's, in, who's in our audience today. And we wanna acknowledge her. Thank you, Linda, for coming. And um, 
just to remind everybody that Spiritual Awakenings International is donation based. We would like to invite everyone to uh, to make a donation after. Um, please go to our website, www.spiritualawakeningsinternational.org, and there's a donate button. You can click that. Or if you would prefer to, to do something by check, uh, there's a mailing address that will be available too. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kason again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Robert. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is going to be Lewis Brown Griggs. And we're delighted to have Lewis speaking for us today. Um, Lewis, Lewis was born and raised in the Minneapolis St. Paul area of the United States, but he's living now and I guess for a long time in the San Francisco Bay Area, Berkeley, I do believe. And Lewis has had a really remarkable life because he's had three, what he'll talk to you about, the NDEs, OBEs, STEs, whatever label we want to give them, which have all deeply impacted his life, you know, starting with March 11th, 1977, where he says he had a conversation with God in the light, which uh, where he learned what his true life calling was, which was in the area of uh, human diversity. And then many years later, in June 15th of 1997, on Father's Day, Lewis sustained a traumatic brain injury while whitewater rafting that resulted in an eight-day coma, and he needed three years of in-hospital traumatic brain injury recovery, which is phenomenal. And then most recently, in August 6th to August 16th in 2020, Lewis survived a COVID-19 infection where he had to be under the ventilator for a length of time. And while under the ventilator, he was lost and saved twice and had um, profound OBE or NDE experiences. In his worldly uh, work and life, he also has a BA in political science and MBA in entrepreneurial management. But as he's, uh, he will tell you about propelled by his first NDE, he felt compelled to change the field of his work into the field of diversity consciousness. Uh, and in 2012, he also became a certified professional co-active leadership coach. Anyway, we are absolutely delighted to have uh, Lewis Brown Griggs as our speaker today. So with no further delay, I'm gonna turn it over to Lewis. Wow, with that introduction, you've told everybody all about all three. I think we can all go home now, right? So you, that's a great intro. Thank you, Yvonne. And the good news about all of these experiences, for those of us who are used to sharing them, is that very little of the attention is on the actual accident, the way I was just introduced. The most important thing we all learned is what did we learn from this crisis and how do we apply it to the rest of our lives? So when I share these with people like this as, uh, on Zoom or in person, I try to have it seem and feel less about me and more about the learnings and the experiences, many of which are useful for you, okay? We all have different crises, don't we, from which we learn. And it doesn't mean we're glad they happen, but we do have our greatest learnings from these crises. And uh, I like to describe that given our human diversity, we all sort of enter our learning through different doorways. But whatever the details of those doorways, those crises, those life experiences, we tend to end up closer to our oneness and our similar learnings and our similar consciousness, okay? We just uh, had to go through the learnings we had to go through to get it, as I say. So I'm gonna share with you three, and I want to try to promise you that I won't actually have nine. Yes, I'm a Leo, but I'm not a cat. And my wife said, please don't have any more. These are too close. And uh, so I'm gonna do my best just to have these three be it. So I appreciate having the time with you. And I love to see as many of your videos as you're comfortable with because 
I get to see who I'm with. And um, I can't with this number connect personally with each of you the way I could if there were 10 or 25, but I, I still like looking around and seeing you and it helps me feel to be part of this group. So Yvonne, if you show them the first slide, I will tell you that um, on March 11, 77, right after I had driven across country from Boston to San Francisco and, and here I was in Berkeley where I live now, still in that old gray, I call it a Berkeley Volvo because you hardly see those old gray Volvos anywhere except in Berkeley now. But that was my girlfriend's car and I totaled it. Uh, now total, we understand means it can't be repaired because its value doesn't, cost, it doesn't match what it would cost to repair it, as you can see. Uh, but when I hit that pickup that had, now we've spun around, but when that pickup came through um, what was not a stop sign, but would uh, not a stop light anyway, but just a stop area. And he didn't stop. And I was coming the other way from 90 degrees and I went right into his rear fender, as you can see. But the important part of this is that I hit my head on the windshield. There were no seat belts then in March 11, 77. And I immediately had the experience of going high speed through the tunnel that, that you hear so many people talk about who've had near-death experiences and all the way into what's called the light, we call the light. I did not stop the way many people do and um, watch the accident or watch the surgery or, or converse with deceased loved ones or any of those things that many others do. It's as if in hindsight, I can tell you, I was called high speed to avoid all of those steps and go straight into the pure absolute light which I experienced right away as um, no words are enough. So I, I used the word the source, the absolute source from which we all come and to which we all go back again. And it's also the source, not only from which we come, but of which we are all one. So if you're, a believer in near-death experiences, or at least the possibility that those might happen, just imagine you never in your prior lives were in the body in which you are now living. So isn't that amazing? That, that starts to change our bias about diversity, isn't it? Look around at all these videos and realize all these human souls were in the bodies of different color, different gender, different nation, or whatever. And this is the life that we're each living now. And I often like saying, you know, if you look around, even though we all have crises in our life and moments when things aren't going the way we wish, right? None of us being perfect. Look around and see if there's any other body you would rather be living in than the one in which you are. And the answer is always, well, no thanks. <laughs> for better and worse, I'm in the one I'm in and learning what I'm learning. So in the light, when I was already on my own, before I heard a voice feeling this source of this oneness, it really helped me recognize the extent to which we are not only all one, but then when we land in these bodies, which is the only DNA in the history of life on earth, starts our incredibly unique life experience and all of our diversity, some of which is our DNA, some of which is our life experiences, the tribes, families, cultures in which we grow up, languages we speak, etc. So now recognize that we are simultaneously all one and uniquely different. So, and everything in between, where we have some things in common and some things different. So now I was beginning to already get what's called a diversity consciousness that I had never had, this 14 generation Anglo white boy growing up in Minnesota. Uh, I, I was so ethnocentric that it had 
I never knew how to do any of the bridging to help me relate to anybody different because I guess I had discovered that everybody else who was different had had to do the bridging to connect to most of us white men and women uh, who've been here for whatever, 10 to 14 generations. So as if that wasn't enough, I then heard this voice talking to me and, and it gets labeled conversations with God, but remember God is whatever word we all choose for whatever we believe is in the source or the God or the various individuals in life that have been amazing teachers, Jesus being among them, okay? Um, and so when I came, when I was in that light and I heard this voice, it said to me very directly, Lewis, you are called here to have this conversation and to be sent back because you're not doing your work. So what is your work? Well, I asked, what is my work? I would love it if you can share with me since I'm in this space of total consciousness, all knowledge, light, love, energy, spirit. This is it. And clearly I've been chosen to do whatever life's work I've been chosen to do, like we all have, based on whatever we need to learn, right? It turns out that our life's work usually comes in a weakness that grows into a strength rather than only a strength, which sometimes when overutilized is a weakness. Does that make sense to each of us? So yes, I had a strength, so-called. I had privilege, I was educated, I was loved, I could do whatever I wanted. But when I was asked, what is it that keeps you from being all you're capable of being, I didn't have a clue until I went deeply enough because I knew I had to come up with the answer myself instead of be given it. And um, it was, as I've just shared, that because I grew up with ethnocentric privilege and never knew how to do the bridging with all the human diversity out there among us, whether it's locally or globally, I said, I answered that I didn't know how to relate to people different than I was. So I, I really only felt comfortable. Even though my parents lovingly told me we're all one under God, I was also told, but you're different here because of the privilege you have. And I didn't like growing up feeling that somehow I'd inherited something that made me better than. I didn't like that. So I never was arrogant. I just felt kind of, truthfully, I felt kind of lonely because I didn't know how to relate to anybody different than me. But so I hung around with all the people just like me. That was easy, wasn't it? For those of you who've had similar experiences, if you just stay in your own tribe, you know, managing uh, our similarities is quite simple. But in this light, I learned that that was what was keeping me from growing further and being, becoming all I might be able to become. So when I said, I guess it's because I don't know how to relate to anybody different. I was told like that best moment in the movie Amadeus, when Mozart hit the perfect note and went, there it is. This voice of whomever we call God, this voice. And by the way, these voices we get when we hear them are always exactly the voices we need to hear. They are whatever gender or whatever language or whatever ethnicity, they're perfect. So I heard clearly that um, after I gave the answer I gave, I was told, there it is. That's the work you're doing, Lewis. And I was immediately sent back down, same speed, right through what we call the tunnel until I landed back in this body, in that car with no physical damage. And I even remember coming into the body. Those of you who've ever tried to put on tight surgical gloves, not the loose blue ones we should wear, but we don't at the kitchen sink or whatever, those really tight ones. I remember feeling the body getting completely, or the soul getting completely back inside the body until I can't do that without my finger. 
until this light just disappeared right out of the car back to where it came from and left me in the car, but undamaged. So I walked out of the car and met the ambulance that had just arrived and said, there's no problem. And of course, I couldn't talk about what I had learned. It was too weird, it seemed. And for many years, I did not share it. However, learning started to happen. So here's where I want you to notice in your own lives. First of all, if you know how to answer the question, if it's asked you, what keeps each of you from being all you're capable of being? And it's the being, not just the doing. We need the balance, the integration of how we are essentially being our authentic natural selves this soul that landed in this body and this body in which this soul landed. That's an integration process we've all had to go through. And I was once even asked, Lewis, what's it like to be a soul living in a body so different than the soul that you've been, that you are and, and that you've been before? And I never thought of it as a problem because I only felt the experience I and we each have as just integration of self and wholeness and oneness. And we all do it in phases, right? You know, we all start as children being completely authentic. It's amazing to watch them now, isn't it? And then we got socialized and then we maybe started to forget who we really were because we had to be like we thought we had to be. And now as adults, through one crisis or another, or if you really have never had a crisis because you've just lived in peaceful meditation your whole life, well, God bless you, but I had to get hit pretty hard to get it. So, and that was just the first experience. But the next learning um, I had was that I noticed doors started to open that I had nothing to do with. So I want each of you to just feel and remember when you've had that experience, that a door opened, that you had nothing to do with controlling and making possible. It's an opportunity for learning and we feel called to go through that door at that time. So those are the kinds of moments where we get an opportunity to learn. And I've just experienced so many of them now. I, I then learned that if you can leave all the skills you do have from whatever privilege or education or learning you have, I like to say, just leave them in the back pocket when you're trying to just be your authentic self and enter a doorway that happened to have opened and discover why you were called into this location. And then when appropriate, you can utilize whatever skills you have to serve not to win versus lose, not to have power over or under, to be in true equity and learn from whatever the opportunity is to grow your essence and your consciousness higher than before. It's amazing. It's even amazing when you come from enough arrogance, like some of us had moments of, where you actually thought I was right or my perspective was right. And you... If you're like I, you've been able to learn how much more wonderful it is that you don't have to be right. And you're not right because there are other perspectives and they bring learnings to us that are gifts to one another. It is such relief not to have to be right all the time. And I know that's not just a white male who has that relief. I know you all do. So that was the first experience. And that that led me unexpectedly to help with a global wife I met in business school to start the first diversity training in this country. Now our focus was to mostly, you know, do one's own work. And then when you've done your own work, you can share it and teach others. So without any shame or blame or judgment, my main focus was to help teach other straight white men who didn't get it any more than I did and to help us learn the self-interest in being able to value the diversity of every human we meet and wonder why we've met and what's the gift that can come here. So that led to 
20 years of running a company that uh, without any competition in the beginning created videos, workshops, national diversity conference, etc. And that was my life. And, it, and it's as if I had been chosen not only for my ethnocentrism and the opportunity to learn and, and share, but I had been chosen because I had the skills to, in the left frontal lobe and with personality and education, et cetera, to help create this company and run it and do public speaking and training and all of that. So we get learnings and we get, we get opportunities not only to grow, but to use our skills. Okay, so not only do we have crises, we have highs in our life, accomplishments, successes in our life as leaders, each of us in different ways with whomever we touch and serve, okay? So there's 20 years after that near-death experience shortened. What else did I need to learn? Well, it may sound strange, but if you show the second slide now, Yvonne, this is me in the center with my wife on my right shoulder, my daughter on my left shoulder, my son in the far right with his hand raised, and the two guides in the back. And I don't remember who that other person is. But here we were going down a river in Glacier Park, Montana. And a 100 foot tall tree came off the shore and landed on my head and my son's head. Now, I want to change the timing for you just to be realistic. This photo was 20 years to the day, Father's Day, June 15th. 1997, when I went back to the same spot, the accident I'm now going to share with you had happened. When that daughter was uh, 15 and that son was 10. And we were going down for the first time ever a whitewater trip up in Montana to introduce nature to them. Uh, because my bipolar daughter had just graduated from the school, helping her become all she was able to become. And now that I'm going to share what actually happened, this being 20 years later, when we're celebrating on the same spot on the river where we had failed to successfully go 20 years before, on January 15th, um, 97, was... Uh, as I said, sorry, was when the accident happened. And this photo was 20 years after that in Father's Day 17, okay? So what happened when a 100-foot tall tree fell off the edge of the river because there'd been so much prior rain and snow melt that the rivers were going very fast and very high and eating the root cakes away from the corners of the river. And this tree landed on my head and my son's head and it was one of those impossible accidents that you can't imagine could have happened with that perfect timing. And it was actually on television the next day in San Francisco where I was living and also in the newspaper. It was such a terrible accident. And my family had been called from around the country to, and told that they were likely to come back to come the next day and have a body deceased that could not live because the brain damage was so severe with fractured skull on both I and my son, both my head and my son's and blood and pus and the tree was on top of my head on the edge of the raft and my son was face down and drowned in the bottom of the raft. Now we're both okay. So now you get to hear the amazing learnings that came out of this. Whew, like how do we be grateful for this one? <laughs> Well, I had uh, been in a coma for eight days instead of dying. The neurosurgeon told my family, and I haven't met him, I wish I could, that he thinks maybe the only reason I lived and have been able to recover as fully as I have is that he, a neurosurgeon, decided that the spirit, these are his words, he felt that the spirit was trying to live so fully, he wanted to give it a full chance. So instead of doing surgery to remove 
the portions of the brain, the left frontal lobe that had been so damaged by the impact on the other side that pushed the brain against the skull. Instead of doing surgery, which would have kept me alive, but permanently damaged with brain damage, he gave me meds and drugs to try to make sure that I didn't have seizures and strokes, et cetera, and it worked. So when I came out of the coma eight days later, the damage to the left frontal lobe was so severe that I didn't know how to read, write, walk, or talk. Amazing. I didn't know who those people were in the room. My wife, my children. My son had come out of his coma in three days. And he was all right. He had minor damage. And he's now fine. He's an engineer at GoPro. And, uh, you know, because of the brain injury, he needed special attention. So he got to take more time on his SAT, which is why he got 100 on the math and 800, sorry, on the math. <laughs> he, he had time to finish it. Anyway, <laughs> see the different gifts from each crisis. In my case, the brain damage was so severe that it took me three years of brain injury recovery in the hospital. Now, I didn't have to live in the hospital. I had to be taken to the hospital every day. I couldn't be left alone because I couldn't be functional alone. And I wasn't able to do anything. So I want to share with you the most amazing learning of all. One of them was amazing gratitude, amazing gratitude, because strange as it sounds, I didn't know quite what I was missing. So everything I regained every week or two in a three year process made me extremely grateful for what I was now able to do. And now memory would come back and I, I and other people could help me re rekindle the memory. And I could have such appreciation for what I now was able to do. And yet the biggest learning, if we now go back to my experience in the white light and our oneness, I wonder what else I needed to learn. I hadn't done anything bad. I had been very successful applying from, from a spiritual drive, uh, diversity consciousness. And with videotapes and conferences, et cetera, as I told you, and using all the skills I had to serve. So why did I need my entire left frontal lobe removed, essentially? <laughs> it's e easy to smile now about it because I'm recovered. I mean, sometimes I'm only 95% recovered and sometimes 110% recovered. I think you all know what I mean by that, too, if you go back to your own crises and the learnings, and you're not glad the accident happened, but the learnings changed your life. And yet there are times in our normal states of mind and body and spirit when we aren't 100%. Sometimes we're 80 if we're sick. Sometimes we're 90, sometimes we are 110, and we feel channeled with such amazing consciousness and intelligence that comes in and gets applied through whatever our skills are. It's as if that book or that art or that skill we have just comes through us and through our hands or through our, our language or whatever our tools are. But in this case, I had none of them any longer. All of the ones I had used for 20 years were now gone. And so what was there to learn? Well, I'll tell you, as I tried to walk in the first week, of being in the hospital on those bars, I was at least aware that there was nothing, if you use um, the metaphor of either the tornado or the hurricane, whichever one you grew up closest to, I discovered myself at the center of the storm and all these other external things um, that I would had been once able to do, I was not able to do. It's as if at that moment, I was not a father, a tennis player, uh, a diversity trainer, uh, anything. I just was trying to walk. 
but at the center of all my chakras, for those of you who are used to this language, was our, my soul. So I want you to all get that each of us does have this soul, spirit, call it what you will, our essence, our core, and that the soul can never be damaged, never dies, okay? It is 100% light and love and energy and spirit right now at the core of each and every one of us. And to be able to trust that that's not only true within ourselves, but with everyone we meet and almost look at them that clearly as if that soul, that core self wants to express the light and love and energy it feels within and its natural self, being exactly who it's able to be, no longer at that moment trying to be or do anything other than what is naturally true for it. That's what I learned. And as strange as it sounds, it's as if in order for me to learn that, more than I had learned in the light, I at least temporarily for three years of recovery had to have the entire left frontal lobe removed because I'd run my life with it for 20 years. So what an example in what I had to learn. And some of us have heard uh, the description of what the brain can do to heal called brain plasticity. Well, I took an MRI of the same spot in my brain just a few years ago, about three or four years ago. And this accident, remember, was now 23 or four years ago, five, 25 years ago. And the MRI shows almost no recovery of the same portion of the brain, which means that I am lucky to have experienced the re-synapsing, the recreating of synapses in the left brain and yes, even the right brain for this male <laughs> in order to be able to do and accomplish the, all those multitasking tasks. And I even had the experience once when I was tested by an insurance company who thought maybe I wasn't really brain damaged. So they found out I was, but in this three hour test, I'll never forget when there was one thing I was not able to do. And about two hours later, I was asked exactly the same thing and I did it. And I actually, I, I, this is only an exaggeration as much as words aren't enough to express it, okay? But it's as if I felt a <coughs> something switched from the left brain <laughs> to the right brain where it found the answer and it, and it was able to conclude it. And there has been so much of that that I still like to call myself about 95% recovered most of the time and other times 105 or 10. It's like, wow. And the gratitude started to build as I discovered every week that I've recovered something more. And even this week, this is sort of an aside, but a good friend of mine who recently had a stroke, another high school friend of mine, I was on video with him and his wife and he can't talk, but he could hear everything. And I described to him that this experience I had to recover is possible, I believe, for him also to recover. And in just a few months since he's begun, since his stroke, he's begun to have some recovery. So for him to hear that from somebody else who's gone through, even though it's somewhat different, a major physiological and brain injury and, and recover from it, just I could see him start to smile. His eyes were smiling and, the, and both only the side of his face that really was operative, you know? <laughs> But it was real and the spirit was in there. And I told him that I had discovered the soul and spirit and that he still has that too. And if he doesn't know that yet, how much his life and his kids love him, wife and kids love him, but so do I. And so do everyone who's known him. So anyway, that I share again for all of us to learn in our own crises. I hope we have. Okay. 
not only gratitude, oneness, individuality, um, our, our, own, our own ability to be only what we're able to be. And we've now learned what a spectrum we are on compared to the days when we thought everybody had to be either this way or this way, whether it was male or female or white or black or Asian or Hispanic or, you know, just please remember every word is a word. Every word is a label. Every label is part of language and that's okay. It's just limited. And that we are not only one, but uniquely different and no label accurately describes us completely, even though it partially describes us. All right, that's key to enable us to be our full self and to be able to reconnect and bridge, right? And code switch, talk with grandmother this way, grandson this way, you know, business client this way, lover this way. It's a great gift, isn't it? So that was a second near-death experience. And it not only took three years to recover, it took me out of essentially the career I was in. I had to lay off all the employees. I couldn't run the company. I couldn't do anything I used to do. And I had to rediscover how to be and serve. And that's when I had to learn to stop speaking. You can tell I have no trouble speaking until the, until the internet goes down. But I had to stop speaking and just listen. Haven't we all learned that at the moment we're speaking, we're not learning anything new? <laughs> we're only learning something new when we listen. So I had to learn to facilitate instead of just speak and train. And then I had to learn to coach. In coaching, they taught me in the first day, Lewis, shut up. Tape your mouth. Ask questions of the other. The truth is in the other, the student or the client or your friend or your lover or your child. The truth is in the other. And we need to listen to what they're feeling now. Ask them questions, not manipulative ones about how we know the right answer. Questions about what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what they think is keeping them from being all they're capable of being. And their answer is as close as they yet have gotten to it. And just our facilitation and our coaching and our listening can help them. Instead of them thinking that they have to do it the way we did it. All of those were learnings. Well, you've all had those learnings too, haven't you? Different crises coming through different doors. You could each be the speaker today and share how you learned it. And if we can just listen to each other's stories, they're amazing. Everybody's story. And then there's more, isn't there? As if going into the light once and then having the opposite experience of being trapped inside my own soul, <laughs> just where I am, wasn't enough to help me learn. Why on earth, two years ago, when COVID came into our lives in the beginning of 20, I first got diagnosed with stage three cancer, colorectal cancer. Yes, we all have every part of the same of our body that's almost identical, almost. And when it dysfunctions, it dysfunctions. And cancer, Stage three isn't stage four, but it's very close. And I was told that surgery would be necessary probably after lots of chemo and radiation to make it smaller. And I said, no, I do not want to do surgery. I want to do everything possible to kill the cancer. And any of you who've had this experience or are now either already have learned or are in the process of needing to learn that what feeds cancer that we all have that at some point might start to overgrow beyond what is necessary. And, and we all have 
the possibility of having cancer happen. What, what makes it happen is some combination, I speak not as a doctor here, but just as one who's gone through it and learned, some kind of stress or some inappropriate amount of sugar. Ooh, cancer cells just love eating sugar and grow faster. <laughs> so I had to go, what have I eaten? How can I eat differently? And I even discovered that CBD, which I didn't even know what that was, it's the portion of marijuana, not the THC that impacts how we feel for better or worse, but the CBD attacks cancer cells. Chemo attacks all cells. Those of us who've had us, chemo is a terrible experience and yet it has a function that works whether you choose to do it or not. And I chose to do everything at once to see if that might work. So my wife, you know, took, um, what is it? Uh, broccoli and, and chopped it up and grew roots of it and all kinds of things. There's certain foods, fruits, fruits and vegetables that help kill cancer and eat properly. So we did all of that in addition to chemo, such chemo. And I was so brave as a arrogant athletic male to say, oh, I don't need a port. Just put it, go ahead and put it in my arm. I've had stuff in my arms before. Don't do that. If you ever have the opportunity, it is so painful. It is horrendous. The impact that chemo has when it goes straight into those veins and blood vessels and then into your system. It is horrendous. Get a port. Because for some reason, when they put it into the port, you hardly feel anything. It just goes throughout your system in a much simpler way. And, and uh, I'm pounding because that's where the port usually is put in us. And now it's gone and there's only a little scar. And I only had to have a port in there for a, a year. <laughs> The things we start to accept when we're glad to be alive and breathing, which we're going to hear more about in a moment. So with chemo, for six months, I had to deal with all the aspects of that. I won't bore you with it. Some of you have had it, some of you haven't. But on the sixth month of my last day of getting chemo put into this port, I also was infected by COVID at the same Kaiser Hospital here in the Berkeley, Oakland area. The same day of my last day of chemo. And what happened very quickly, this now being two years ago, we're just a month short of when chemo came in our lives, but I mean, uh, COVID came in our lives, but in my life, it came, let's say in July, about six months from now. And it attacked me so quickly at my age that it, I could hardly breathe. And I had to be rushed to ER. And when I got to ER, I, I, I had to be rushed to ICU. They tried every possible way to help me to breathe, different pressures to force it in, gentle ways that I could breathe it in, lie on my stomach. Oh, some of you know, and some don't know, just imagine the difficulty of the breath we take. Every breath we take is an incredible miracle. I have to call Stuart and Sting and ask them to remake that song for those of us who've had to go through this. A lack of breathing. Talk about something primal. And I couldn't do it. And they said, Lewis, if you don't do it, we're gonna put you under the ventilator. If you can't breathe, you've got to take this in. And I said, I can't, and I'm not going under the ventilator. I must've been a stubborn guy. I, I'm not going under the ventilator. I'm gonna to try to breathe. <clears throat> and it's like, I think the last time I said, I'm not going under the ventilator, <laughs> they got me. <sighs> I have no memory of being under the ventilator. I only have a memory of being for 10 days in another coma. 
out of my body, having various experiences. I had no consciousness, the soul that I am, had no consciousness that I was under a ventilator. I, I don't know how to explain how that's true. It's just true for my experience. And I had various experiences and I will come down to just the two days during which my wife was told every day talking to the doctors that we may not be able to bring him back tonight. His lungs have collapsed. And they found a way to push stuff. I had so many tubes. Oh my God, I forgot to tell you to show that slide. Now's the perfect time actually. Show that slide and take a breath and notice this for all of you who either have or have not been here. When you look on the left, when you're under the ventilator in the upper left, every tube goes into every orifice of our entire body to feed, to put in oxygen, to put things in arteries, in veins. Oh my God, it's amazing. And that's the condition we're in. And for 10 days, and in the upper left of the upper left, you see my wife who happens to be on the cell phone. <laughs> My cell phone, which the nurse was holding so she could see me and talk to me, even though I have no memories of it. And while she was told that they weren't sure they could bring me back. And for three months, I was in the bed with her at home. But for 10 days under the ventilator, there she was. You can imagine what that. And in the lower center, you see the nurse uh, heard me. And that ICU nurse, before I get to my, my near-death near experience, I want you to appreciate that she was one of the nurses who first went to New York when all the dead bodies were being put into trucks. And then she was back in the Bay Area. And this was her entire job was 12-hour shifts, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, taking care of ICU patients under the ventilator helping with the doctors to keep me alive, to, to put the right things in each tube, you know, to take care of my body. And oh, she had to do it all. And after I lived, this is, again, before I get back to the near-death experience, after I lived, that woman came into my recovery room and broke out crying. Because in six months, every single patient she had taken care of died. Everyone. And I was the very first patient she cared for that had lived in six months. And now she's had come and had dinner with us and told us now the total number is maybe four, maximum five of her entire year and a half. So just an appreciation for what they are doing. And then in the far right, you see, once I was in recovery, after being in bed for three months, unable to get out of bed, you can see that I had lost 60 pounds. It's not a joke, but my wife said, my God, my German wife, German American wife looked and said, my God, you look like Auschwitz. And that was the very first day, that photo, when they could get me out of bed because the corner of the bed felt so terrifying. I thought I'd fall off. Can you believe it? I felt like a child. And I was now standing because they lifted me up. I didn't have the strength to lift myself up. And I'm leaning on those bars with that woman's hands on my front and my back, looking afraid. Look at my face, afraid. Oh, talk about the things we have to go through and come back and therefore the gratitude we have every day, those of us who've been through whatever crisis we have. Huh? Okay, so you can put that slide away. Thank you, Yvonne. So come back with me to being out of my body. Just imagine I was out of my body in what I call a geodesic dome. We've seen photos of these domes. Why? Have other people been here? I don't know. 
but I was in a dome and I've seen pictures of them before, or because I've seen pictures of them before, this is what I imagined I was in. I don't know. I'm just telling you that's where I was. And I wasn't alone. I was in a hexagonal section of the dome picture instead of this four sided rectangles you're looking at now, hexagonal section with all four limbs connected to four of the six corners of that form. Like in the bed where our arms and legs were tied so we didn't pull all those tubes out that you could see. We had to be tied so long. And when they finally allowed us not to be tied because we had mild consciousness back and we were so frustrated, we had mittens on, you know, picture the mitten, not the, not the glove with fingers, the mitten, but picture it's this big so that even though we can move, we're not able to use these digits to do anything with any of these tubes. Yep. Anyway, back to the dome. In the dome, I was every minute of every day for 24 hours after I was told that they weren't sure they could bring me back because the lungs had collapsed. They were able to go inside the lungs. I don't have memory of this. This is after the fact. And suck out enough of the damaged area and the, the collapsed portion of the lungs was able to be blown back up a little bit. And now it's only 90%. I have 10% still damaged. And when I cough, <coughs> you heard how deep that is. I don't have a cold. That's because that bottom 10% isn't functional and maybe never will be. <clears throat> so there's still some phlegm that comes up. But you know what? So what? I'm breathing. So back up under there. I was every minute saying, live, live, live. I have to live. I have to get back. I have to get back to continue to serve, to keep working with myself and others who need to really recognize that we're all one and uniquely different. I'm serious. I had this thought up in the dome that I have to get back. You know, I'm really not my chronological age. I'm just younger every time I come back because the spirit is so alive that it needs to not only breathe and love first, live and then love, but then thirdly to serve. That wasn't enough, that 24 hours. There was another day they were told, all right, they got the lungs mostly working, but the heart failed in a way. It didn't totally collapse and failed. It, it had such irregular beats that there were times when there was pain i still have it once in a while where it just stops or it gets in a blood clot and it has to be cleared and wow those are close moments when i may die i may have a stroke you know i may have a seizure and so when those moments happen they're terrifying i've had some of them after recovery and now it's a little better but it's not the same so what i'm alive and i'm breathing but back in the dome, 24 hours more, I've got to live, I've got to live. And then one morning, somebody came and unlocked all these hexagonal sections like doors. And everybody else except I went. I didn't know why. I felt like, what's the mistake? Why won't my door open? Why won't they let me out? And as it turns out, 24 hours later, after just hanging on alone in the dome, instead of going, I came back into this body. Again, I remember coming back until I'm in this actual body, <clears throat> even though it still couldn't do anything. And what they do is they reduce the, the drugs that are keeping the mind totally gone and unconscious and in a coma. So I'm about halfway back, but they keep the drugs in the body that can't feel anything and any pain or any trauma and therefore can't do anything, but at least the heart and lungs were mostly working now. So they brought me back. And then I realized later, I'm, I'm imagining this, I haven't counted exactly the number of people that were in ICU with me, 
But what happened up there was that all of the others in ICU with me had died. And I was the only one who had survived and come back. And it's now like a story at the Kaiser in Oakland that this guy, this old white guy, had somehow his spirit lived and he came back. It's pure luck as well as pure miracles that they performed and pure spirit. Who knows? Who knows? But I'm really lucky to be back. And then it took not only the three months in bed and all those terrible experiences before I could even get out of bed, right? But once I was alive, I remember my wife said, oh my God, on the cell phone, you just came out of a, out of your ventilator. And I, not fully back, went, I wasn't on a ventilator. I told them I wasn't going to be on a ventilator. She said, ah, and she and the nurses and everybody learned to just put it wherever I was and go, okay, Lewis. Okay, Lewis. And for three months, I had to just keep losing more and more weight. I couldn't move my body. I couldn't get out of the bed. And my wife said, oh my God, we had been together now, this my final perfect love of my life for seven years. And she said, God, now we have to get married. These rings aren't enough. We have to get married because you're alive. And I don't ever want you to have any more near death experiences. And I said, I can't get married until two things. I have to be able to walk out of this bed and go to the toilet on my own. I'm so tired of being in only bed and having the bed be my toilet. Sorry for the graphics, but everybody who's been there knows and everybody who's served knows. It's like, you forget all humility. It's like, who cares? They're just our bodies. I can't do anything about it. That's what they're there for, to take care of us. So I will not get married until I'm able to come home and walk to the toilet and use it myself. Talk about a miracle after breath. <laughs> and secondly, I won't get married until I'm able to breathe oxygen out of the air instead of out of a machine. And that took six months. In stages, first you need the machine all the time with a mask all night, a mask so that somehow it's pushed in more. And when the mask is no longer necessary, then you need, I've forgotten what they're called, in your nose. And then when you sleep at night at home, you still need a little mask anyway, and you need a big machine in your house. With, and we had cords that go everywhere, you know? with oxygen near the dinner table, near the bed, near the toilet, so that everywhere I go, I have my oxygen. So when Yvonne says, let's start by just taking a breath. The gratitude is so deep to be able to take a breath that deeply without coughing. I, I'm back. <laughs> oh my God, I'm back. I can breathe. I can walk. I can talk. I can love. I can go to the toilet. I can, when this program is over, I'm going on the tennis court. This is already. <laughs> and now I get to open and listen to all of you ask questions or share some of your own experiences. We get to go wherever you want to go. Now, these are three different experiences. If you had any questions about this one or that one or that one, any of us who've come back from these experiences knows there are no boundaries. You get to ask anything you want. And we either share what we've learned or what we think is true, but we never can promise what is true out there just what our own experience is and what it feels like to have mind, body, and soul integrated into oneness 
and simultaneously be one with you and simultaneously be uniquely different and have our learnings come through different doors. How did I need to get hit so hard three times to get just that? And now I live like this every day and today for this time with each of you. So it's your turn to be with us and ask questions, okay? Thank you very much, Lewis. In the, in the words of the immortal Spock, fascinating. <laughs> I, I have to say that uh, you, my attention was just compelled and uh, it was so much resonance in what you're saying. So thank you so much. So we do have some, uh, some, some questions coming through. So one of them was what type of cancer and the status now, and uh, another person answered colorectal, but uh, what, hey. what is your status now with the cancer? Okay, again, Anybody who has cancer or has had it knows that you sometimes don't love sharing about it. And sometimes you do. I'm one of those who does. I, I live in pure light. And as I said, we all have the same bodies, literally, almost. Even our genders, as you all know, I won't do the graphics, but you know, we were once just a sim in utero. We weren't yet decided. And then various parts of our body develop one way or another way to call us whatever gender, and now we've learned there's a spectrum. All right, I don't need to go there now, that's another TED talk or something. But, <clears throat> so what I had was stage three colorectal cancer. And the reason they used both words was that in the various parts of the colon, they did find a few, but I mean three or four polyps, little tiny beginnings of growth that shouldn't be growing there. That They don't call it cancer. It's not diagnosed as cancer yet, but it could become. And they were able to go in, into the colon and cut those out or destroy. I can't remember how they did it, frankly, but they got rid of them, okay? And that's the good news. And then they saw other little ones in the lungs, which scared them. Now, the biggest problem was a cancer, a tumor in the rectum. Yes, we all have a rectum. <laughs> and some of us can smile and some of us can't, but you know exactly how it functions, which we don't need to describe, but you know. And when it doesn't function, just imagine what a nuisance. And if it's removed, what a nuisance that would be if you're carrying a bag around to have you finish all of your excretion. Oh. So I said, no, I don't want surgery. And I want to do all those things I already told you about. And so with chemo, it helped reduce it. And then here's the part I missed, but listen to this terrible. Once I got COVID after six months of chemo, I was supposed to two weeks later start the radiation five weeks of radiation to go in from the rear, sort of from the coccyx area, not to go into the rectum, but through the body. They send the radiation right at the, the tumor to try to kill it. And yes, it sprays a little. So it has side effects in the same area. Not good experiences, no matter where they do it. But they couldn't do it because I had to recover first from COVID and the ventilator and the heart and the lungs. And they said, but you know what? If we try to wait until you've recovered, it'll be too late. We have to do it now. And if we're, you're in recovery and you try to leave recovery to come get radiation, they won't let you back in recovery because of COVID. You might bring it with you. Okay. So we have to take all five weeks of radiation and do it now in five days, one day at a time. All, all of it. Oh, whoa. Guess what? The good news and the bad news. That really destroyed a lot down there. 
some of which has recovered and not all of which has. And the good news is they killed the cancer. We can't find it in all of the last year. I've done MRIs and more colonoscopies or whatever the word is for just the short version. I, I can't remember. And they can't see it from the inside. And I'm looking at the screen going, whoa, it's not there. There's just the white scar where it was. And from the outside, they can't see it. And they're always so conservative. They say, that doesn't mean it isn't inside the wall and couldn't grow later. So we have to do this every three months. And then we have to do it every six months. And then we have to check again every year or two. But the good news is the cancer's gone. I have to have surgery. And just to make you smile, my rectum works. <laughs> I hope yours does too. Okay, next question. Thank, thank you. There's a couple questions about the geodome, uh, Lewis. Um, one of them was how many were in the geodome with you? And was there any communication between the souls in the, in the geodome? And you, you seem to imply there was a correlation between the people in the geodome and the people in the ICU with you. Such great questions. So again, I have to be careful to say, yes, I'm very clear that the other entities were each in their own section of the dome with me. And I don't know the exact number because I haven't yet done the research to see if what I presume to be true was true, that the number up there matched the number in ICU with me, but it felt like it was between eight to 10, eight to 12 of us that were uh, actually under a ventilator, not just in ICU, under the ventilator. Okay, and then since I haven't done the research yet um, to discover that is it true that they all died? I'm only interpreting that when the doors were open and they all left, they all died. Now, does that mean they all died at the same moment? That's not likely, is it? But within those 10 days, it is very likely. So how accurate was this experience, out of body experience. This is a perfect near death experience in a way, because they define that I have to be out of my body and having a consciousness of my body. But, you know, it could also be called a spiritually transformative experience or an out of body experience, or again, words and labels aren't enough. Because the first one in the light was perfect, even though my body wasn't damaged. I even had a conversation with God. And I was in the white light and I remember it perfectly. Whereas the middle one of the white water river accident, they say, oh, that was not a near death experience, Lewis, because you didn't in that case, leave your body and be conscious out of your body. So that spiritual experience, when that's the one where like, just like under the ventilator, I, they thought I was dead until they discovered that there was some life. And they thought my son was dead until they pushed all the water out of his lungs and saved him. So what's near death? Just where we go when we die with total consciousness and come back totally healthy? Or when we're in the river dying? <laughs> language is language. All right, so I don't have proof. I just have an experience, out of body experience that they all died. And I do know afterwards that without knowing the number, that I was the only one under the ventilator in Kaiser, Oakland, <clears throat> at that time, who lived instead of died. That much I have been told. Okay, next question. Um, so there was one question about your second near-death experience, which I think you just answered. So I'll go on. Um, Liz. Uh, you know what? I, I'd like to hear there's a wonderful thing since we have time. I'd like to hear that question because I have, I bet I have an answer. Let me try it, okay? The question was specifically, what was the NDE like for the second NDE after the raft accident? <clears throat> okay, here's how I'm gonna answer that. Because as I just said, to be ethical and transparent, 
I did not have an experience out of my body that's called a near-death experience. I was, I, I want to call it the trauma to the body was so severe. And we've all had, diff, we've all had trauma from minor to major. And what trauma is, is, as I understand it, is what the body, mind, spirit does to make sure we're not experiencing what what is so awful we can't yet experience it and then we go through some recovery and we either never recover the memory of that experience some people have that or we do and what i decided to do after a year of trauma therapy which i haven't mentioned i asked you know this trauma therapy has really helped me get to the stage as strangely obnoxious as this boy must be, that I wanted to try to learn what experience I actually had had the moment the tree hit that I hadn't been able to experience because the trauma was so severe. Is there any way to go find out if I have any memory of it? And the answer was sometime. And so I was taken by the trauma expert, uh, the trauma therapist, to be a guinea pig on stage with Peter Levine, known to be one of the leading trauma experts in the country who wrote a book called, uh oh, I can't remember, uh, Recover the, Triger, uh, the Tiger or something. Uh, if somebody knows it, say it, Brian, if you know it, because uh, it's worth people know about this. Awakening the Tiger? Awakening yes. the Tiger, yeah. Yes, okay. And he's the author, but he's done other books. And so I was taken in his annual meeting, which happened to be in San Francisco, with about 350 trauma experts around the country. And they put me on stage. And Peter said, hello, Lewis, what can I do for you? And he's trying to model for other therapists what you maybe can do. So I said, I would like you to take me back to the moment of the accident on the river at which the tree fell and crashed, crushed my skull and my brain to see if I'm able to remember any of it. And he said, okay, I'll try. Take a breath and to shorten the story, here I was on stage being mildly hypnotized and I can't remember what he said or did, but I remember my, I have three experiences that I had not remembered. And now I wanna tell you the memory I had, which is almost an answer to that very question, which is exactly what I thought that question was gonna be, thank you. And the three experiences were this. One, just picture this in your own body now. I'm, I'm dying. I've been crushed and I'm trying with every second, just like in the dome, but now, 25 years before that, I'm dying and I have to live. I have to survive. I have to survive. I have to survive. I have to survive. And then something happened. A second thing happened. As strange as it sounds, while my head was still under the tree, they hadn't yet discovered I'm alive. There was blood and pus everywhere. I, soul, spirit, I, not personality, not with consciousness, okay? I don't have the kind of memory that can remember this and see this. I'm telling you that in this hypnosis, I discovered, guess what? Now I'm alive. Okay, I'm alive. Next, where's my boy? And I started crying on stage because my 10-year-old boy, Ian, was, I had no sense that he was okay. Somehow I had a sense my daughter was okay. As it turns out, she avoided the tree and wasn't hit. My son at that moment had been drowned face down in the bottom of the raft with a fractured skull. And I'm going, where's my boy? And I'm crying on stage going, where's Ian? And then 
the tears went away. And somehow I became aware that he was alive. I didn't know at that moment that he was in the arms of my daughter who had been told that the way to keep him alive is to talk to him and keep his eyes open. The helicopter is almost there. He had two hours to live and they were gonna take him away before me because I had four hours to live and they discovered I was alive. I didn't know any of that, but I got, I'm alive. And number two, my son is alive. The third feeling was as strange as it sounds. Okay time to start recovering. What can I do? What can I do in this condition? And some of us know what I'm talking about. Whatever state of mind or body we're in, in that crisis, there is an aspect of our consciousness, our soul, our being that is just glad we're alive and trying to be whatever we're capable of being and recover in whatever way we can now. Do we ever get Sad, yes. Angry, yes. Irritated, yes. And somehow, in almost all of us, the will and the desire to live is so powerful that we accept where we are as the reality with which we must deal with that reality and try to be. That is the answer to that question. And that was my in body, out of body, in consciousness, where was the consciousness experience that I wasn't able to reach because of the depth of the trauma? Thank you for asking. Next question. Yeah. So uh, Linda R says, that was absolutely phenomena, phenomenal. Uh, Liz says, I have had many NDEs, pain every day of my life, cancer, tragedy, but every day has been a blessing. The greatest blessing is I have not been able to walk for many years and in a wheelchair. The wheelchair is the greatest way to serve and love. Thank you so much, Lewis. Amazing. Yeah. And see, we each end up, she, what, that's just what I just said. Whatever our reality is, we end up accepting that one. Because what else can we do except accept that one and then learn various things, various ways to do this or that? Thank you for sharing that. Okay, next. Uh, Susanna says, your wife sounds like a saint. Tell us about her. (laughs) My current and final wife is a saint. Now, we all were, we all loved, we all had relationships that didn't work, but I am still currently lifelong friends with the mother of my children, who herself is bipolar. I hadn't known that. That's why our daughter was bipolar and our son was not, and we love, all of us love her. My current wife loves her. My, the mother of my kids loves my current wife, and that's lucky. It took a while. Divorce isn't easy, but we're all one again. And um, my current wife had, an, had a marriage of 25 years whose husband had affairs, and um, I had a relationship between that first marriage and this where that uh, wife rings without paper, had affairs. And suddenly we realized there's another learning for all of us. Hmm. When a prior relationship didn't work perfectly, is it all their fault? Well, guess what we're all able to do? We're all able to notice and even point out accurately that other people could also see what is imperfect about that other. And if we've made any progress or when we did finally, we're able finally to notice that relationship took two of us. We, part of what didn't work relationship, something, the most arrogant righteous thing is I just chose wrong. Well, if that's where you're stuck, well, stay there until you are tired of that. Because when we go beyond that to go, what was my part? What didn't work about that? What kept me from being all I was capable of being in that relationship? Not what he or her, 
was responsible for? What was I responsible for? And now that I'm aware of that, how can I, in my next relationship, accept no less of myself first or of the other than being 100% our authentic self? And yes, that means we all make different choices. Are we mana? Are we poly? Are we this? Are we this? Are we... I'm not making the judgment there. I'm just telling you that my current wife and I discovered in a workshop where we met on relationship called choice, that we were one of the only 10% of the people in the room whose attitude was, we think monogamy is the greatest intimacy on earth to be just with this best friend that we trust, we know everything, we live in transparency. I love her children, she loves my children. She had a special child, I had a special child. That meant when I see her special child, I'm able to go, I see you, I love you. And she can do that with mine as in addition to our so-called normal ones. But you know, the special ones have gifts that we normal ones don't, don't they? So yes, we happen to love like we've never loved. We are the best friends ever. We tell 100% truth. We live in transparency. We love each other's children. And God, now we can be more fully all we're capable of being. And now that we're alive and breathing and loving, we can serve. Yes, work comes third after life and love, but we can serve with whatever gifts we have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, universe. Yes, she's, she's the guy. So Linda Truax, who is uh, the founding SAI board secretary and treasurer, asks, Lewis, a few years ago, you introduced me to the video Beyond Our Sight. Can you share more about the messages shared in that video? Thank you. <clears throat> yes, you saw, if you go all the way back to the beginning of our uh, chat, the very beginning, I said, hi, from San Francisco Bay Area, lewis at griggs.com, in case you ever want to email me. And then I put in another link on my YouTube page where you can go watch all my diversity videos or my other near-death experience, the interviews, et cetera. And to answer your question, you can watch my TED Talk called The Gift of Near Death. That's why this today was called The Gifts of Near Deaths. <laughs> but the first one was called The Gift of Near Death. And it's in my YouTube page, or you can just put it into YouTube on its own and you'll get it. And that being a story of mostly my first and a little bit my second, way more fun than any one of our stories, all of which are amazing. Everyone's story here today is amazing and way more interesting is this documentary created called Beyond Our Sight, which is 52 minutes, not 18 minutes, like TED Talks always have to be, right? So 52 minutes, you need either popcorn or a meal or whatever. And it is wonderful because it has about three or five of us sharing aspects of our near-death experiences. And then it's mixed with... Um, believers who are scientists so if you can imagine both being a left frontal lobe scientist wanting to try to gain enough data to be able to prove that this thing called near-death experiences is also true and not just an imagination or a function of brain injury well then you're an open believer instead of a denier and and they're mixed in there and it's a wonderful experience just to watch that, okay? Because you get several experiences coming through different doorways and then you get objectivity mixed with it. And that, by the way, is the best kind of work. I'm gonna be safe with how I say this, Devon and Brian. We all have been members of IANDS, which focused mostly on just near-death experiences. And when some of us started to say, you know, there's more than just that. There are all the other ways we've been out. In fact, I'm so extreme for any of you who've never had one. I say, you've had dreams, haven't you? Just dreams are out of our body in a way, aren't they? 
some of them make sense and some of them make no sense. And others of us have had out-of-body experiences either just meditating or on drugs or on meds or we've been visited by our deceased grandmother or whatever. All of these experiences, whatever you've had, are, are connected to this capacity we have to have souls and spirits, which are different words and therefore different realities than our mind and our body. So. Uh, our, third, our third Linda says, when Nurse Emily cried while telling you that you're the only one in ICU who survived, did you immediately think back to your experience in the geodesic dome thing? Uh, no. <laughs> what, what, what I didn't share about this was that when she walked in and I had been told that she is coming and she just broke out crying, I actually loved love being able to share with you now that my entire experience had nothing to do with me. It was a percent feeling what she was feeling, empathizing with what she was feeling, imagining what she was feeling, what she had been through. And every single person that she'd spent 12 hours taking care of their entire body that this young woman who's my daughter's age had helped save my life, taken care of every inch of my body to keep me alive with my wife on the cell phone and they talked together. You know, it's like, she's suddenly family. She's suddenly, you know, but it's her feelings I was happy. Her experience in six months and right there that felt so wonderful. It's as if it's the, the only way it has to do with me is, I was the one empathizing, I was the one feeling, but it's important to notice that our capacity to be able to just feel what the other's feeling is a wonderful gift. In other words, the gift of seeing another and their authenticity is actually just as wonderful as when we feel seen. So that's, what I mean, if that makes sense for how I, I, I was in her experience and it felt just as wonderful as if she'd been in mine. Next. Thank you, Liz. Uh, there's several that are saying thank you for sharing such wonderful learning. Uh, Patty says, have you ever wondered why it is that you have had to go through so much with all the traumas and the cancer? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> And I, I, all I can do is say again, smiling, but I'm not joking that I must have needed to get hit that hard to get it. <laughs> and if any of you never have been and never had a major crisis in your life, well done. Okay. And I kind of say that from having now lived on both sides of this fence. I, I didn't have one single crisis my entire lifetime growing up. I lived in such love and privilege. And, and I'm not joking. I'm humbly saying that. I'm not bragging about it because, you know, I've stood with African-American male doing diversity training. And he said to all of us, I just want you to know that I never have spent one minute of my entire life experiencing 100% fairness and equity. In response to which, in addition to feeling what he said, even though I've done this work for years, and this happened like three years ago, not 30 years ago, I was able to go, wow, I need to share that I never for once in my life experienced one minute without feeling 100% fairness and equity until I learned later that not everybody had been that lucky. Okay, so it was because of all those experiences that I was given all the gifts I was given of education and, and life and love. And somehow uh, there were some learnings I needed to get that 
I was only going to be able to get with certain more uh, severe or more direct callings. So the first one I want to remind you was I came back in the body with no damage, no pain. Now, when you hit your head on the windshield and there's no seatbelt and the shoulder hits that little side window, you know, do I feel that there's a, you know, a little stiffness, you know, can I crack my back or something? Yeah, but I never had to have anything taken care of. There was nothing that needed to be taken care of. So I say there was no damage, but was there something minor? Yeah, maybe, but that was also, that was called there to have that conversation and to be sent back to do my work and to be all I was capable of being. So it's really in the second two, which were, the first one was closest to the death that we're gonna experience when we leave. No pain, I want to assure you all in case you don't know this, pain is only in the body. So the minute, we leave in any form, there's no pain. There's nothing but light. <laughs> That's why several people say it was so wonderful. Why did I have to come back? Understandable. I'm just one of those very strange ones who says, are you kidding me? I love living so much. The minute I leave, I'm coming back again. And in fact, my current wife and I who have had a prior life together, as have my daughter and I, that I'm aware of, I say, not joking, I, I've got to come back and find you so we make our own children together. <laughs> so, who knows? Anyway, next. Thanks. So there's a number of really compelling uh, entries, but they're not questions. So I'm, uh, we don't have time to, to read all of those, but uh, there's two that are kind of combined. Uh, what learning did you take away from your COVID-related NDE? And what do you feel your life work is now after the third NDE? Thank you. Okay. The answer is, and I got this answer up in the dome. Let's see. Uh, it's as if for the first 20 years, I did what I described. All the consciousness of white light, being driven to do diversity training with all these skills and privilege to help raise all that money and run the company and make it happen and make all those videos. You can watch those videos. Go to, go to my website, griggs.com to see the names of them, going international, valuing diversity, human energy work. And, but you can go to, Amazon and look for those titles and they're there and you can watch them. They're not only for sale at hundred dollars each instead of the 500 they were when they were new, but you can even just watch them. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so um, the learning I got was that in the first 20 years where I did all that work and in the second 20 years where all that was taken away from me, I had to lay off all my employees. I couldn't run the company. My wife at the time, or partner at the time, left and went and had an affair with somebody who had money because the guy who brought in all the money was now maybe never going to recover and was going to be retarded the rest of his life. Poof. There wasn't much love there, was there? So I spent those 20 years, as I told you in one sentence, learning to facilitate and learning how to coach and doing some of that both in some diversity work, but also in some personal coaching and relationship coaching. Um, and in recovery, I even helped with one partner run a horse farm where we took retired racehorses and saved them. We went from one to 25 and I took care of 25 horses all by myself, this city boy. Wow, lots of learning there, but longer story. After the second one, after the... Uh, um, I mean, after that 20 years and in this, in this dome, I got, I not only have to come back to live, I'm not done. And I have to stay for the rest of my life with the love of my life and my children and her children. Well, she's a little younger than I am. So that means I have to live 20 more years. I can't just die after seven years with her. 
I have to live into my 90s like my parents did if I can. So I got, I need to come back and live and love like this. But I have to come back to finish my work. And my work is no longer to do all this diversity training, let's say in groups, let's say all of us, all 51 of us at the moment are doing it together because we all need to do it to get perfect, regardless of our melanin or our gender or our age, okay? city. We all need to do it because tribal natural bias is natural, no shame, no blame. But it gets in the way when we actually aren't dangerous to one another and we actually are working together or living together. We have gifts that help one another. That's what I did for all those years. It's great in these groups, hoping that some other white guys like me would also get it. No shame, no blame, right? Now in the dome, I got, I'm coming back for one purpose. And that is after all we learned in the last two years, even more than we had known before, all of us, just by watching on video, the knee on George's neck. And other things we've watched. We have learned, wow, there is much more to be done. No shame, no blame. We all have whatever histories we have. We didn't create our histories. But that's not a way of escaping ownership and knowledge that all of us come from various histories, our white histories, our black histories in Africa, our Asian histories in Asia, wherever our forefathers and mothers came from. There are some terrible histories of human relationship to human. We're getting more clear about how that isn't the way we want to be living any longer. We have to do better. And we have to do better anywhere on this earth from which we come and where we now sit. Because it's not perfect. And we have to do better here in the U.S., those of us who are here in the U.S. Because it's not perfect, is it? Equity for all. Equity with no power over or under one another. And I won't go into the next TED talk we could do for the next five hours. Democracy. Okay, so I'm back. I got it in the dome. I have to work just with not you, but straight white males like me, who with their privilege and in their jobs can help really be more equitable with everybody in our relationships. And I wanna say, as I have for all these years, as stunning as it sounds, everybody from the boardroom to the bedroom and in between at the grocery store and with our child and with our friend and with our employee, everywhere we relate, we, all of us who are used to our own version of bias or power over need to realize whatever gifts we have, even whatever hierarchy in which we live, ideally we can have a relationship in every one of these that's equitable, that's where we have something that's equal to one another, our soul, et cetera. We don't have power over or under one another. We get to learn from one another. Yes, our children. Yes, our lover. Yes, our siblings. Yes, our parents. Yes, our friends. Yes, anyone or everyone on this group. Wow, what an opportunity for growth. That's what I got. I'm back to do just that if I can, God willing. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. I really appreciate your passion, and I know you could keep going, and there's more questions, but we're at the end of our time, so we're going to turn this back over to Dr. Kaysan. So thank, thank you. you so much. You mean, thank you. My God, what a difference it's going to be between waking up this morning, breathing, looking in the eyes of my best friend ever, getting in the hot tub, getting out of the hot tub, getting on the computer, getting pre-dressed to go play tennis because I know that the minute we click off the screen, I go onto a tennis court and have an entirely different life experience, as will each of you go have yours. I hope with learning and energy and spirit 
that you can not only take with you, but mostly it's yours you're taking with you with whatever you gain by our sharing together. And now you get to go share with whomever you relate. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Great presentation. Thank you uh, for sharing all the things you did. I don't think I'll ever forget those pictures. Um, oh. They say the whole, they, they say it all. But anyways, uh, thank, thank, thanks to everybody that uh, came to this presentation today. Uh, those of you in North America, we have several Europeans um, and you know, somebody from the, from, from the Netherlands and, and somebody from the Canary Islands. Thank you for, thank you wow. for today. Thank you. Um, Spiritual Awakenings International presents uh, online speaker events the third Saturday of each month, of every month. Our next SAI Presents event is Saturday. February 19th, and we're going to have Anna Cecilia Gonzalez, who uh, is from Mexico, a very gifted speaker, a very talented individual. Um, she's also uh, the chair of our uh, SAI Espanol Spanish Committee. She's going to be speaking on Life Goes On, and I would encourage you all to, to sign up for that. I think you'll really enjoy it. SAI is also hosting our next SAI Experiencers Sharing Circle on Saturday, February 5th. And personally for me, that's my funnest thing to do. Uh, if you haven't uh, signed up for one, please do. Both Dr. Kason and uh, uh, Brian, also Dr. Sackett, uh, are the chairs and co-chairs of, of, uh, of those. And they're, they're absolutely wonderful. You get to network with people from all over the world. And um, we also hold Spanish language events the second Saturday of every month. We've launched that. It's going extremely well for all of you, all of you that are in the Espanol world. Our next Espanol event is Saturday, February 12th, and it'll be a Spanish Espanol SAI Experiencer Sharing Circle. And it's phenomenal. Please uh, register for all the events and sharing circles on our SAI website. And uh, again, if you haven't subscribed, please get on the website and subscribe. And if you feel motivated, please donate to our organization so we can keep bringing all these events to you free all over the world. That's our commitment to you. And I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Dr. Uh, Yvonne Kason. Thank you again for coming. Dr. Kason. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Lewis, for a really riveting presentation. It was really fascinating. And I want to remind everyone that the uh, video from this presentation and from all of our SAI presentations um, are posted on our SAI website. Um, this one will be up in a couple of days. The other ones are already there. Also, we did live stream on Facebook. So if you are really eager to see this presentation, you can go on Facebook and you can watch it or you can share it with some of your friends because it's posted on Facebook already on our SAI Facebook page. And uh, with that, I'm going to say uh, goodbye till next time. Thanks for coming. So goodbye, au revoir, au wiedersehen. Hasta la vista, <laughs> adieu, arrivederci, dach, farewell, ciao, and aloha. Bye, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>